Okay, and welcome to another episode of Broken Silicon. I'm Tom of Moore's Law is Dead, and I am here with... Uh, Dan, Tom's brother again. Yeah, and uh, he's wearing... You're wearing a shirt right now that says lit. It's and pretty the dope. Eye, and the eye is a firecracker. I, uh, I mean, I'm just trying to show my patriotism more than anything. And uh, patriotism is lit. Yeah, patriotism is pretty lit. I gotta say... Maine, which is where me and Dan are right now as we record this, actually on vacation in Portland, more patriotic than I expected. There's a lot of American flags in red, white, and blue, like like everywhere. A surprising number of American flags just everywhere. And yeah, all over lighthouses. And pride flags celebrating Pride Month. Yeah, there's it's basically all pride flags, uh, American flags, and like a lot of happy old white people. <laughs> So, I mean, any any thoughts on Maine so far? Uh, Someone probably listens to this in Maine. You guys have very nice people, as far as I can tell so far. Uh, and that's that's about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways, let's get into the news. The first thing I'm just going to bring up is what's your overall thoughts, Dan, on you know yet another press conference for this episode, E3. Kind of AMD and Intel. So, I mean, anything about E3, but mostly about them, I guess. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know what my thoughts are so much. Um, I mean, I'm excited to see what AMD has to bring to the table as far as the 3950X uh, uh, go- goes. I mean, it's out of my price range, so it's not going to make that much of a difference for my purchasing choices. Um, and yeah. Then I think a lot of people see the 3950X and think it's expensive. The way I look at it is I it looks like Threadripper just became cheaper. I mean, huh. it's a, instead of 1000 or $900, it's now 750 It's clocked faster, uses I mean, almost half the energy. So a lot of those are 180-watt chips. And uh, now you only need dual-channel memory. I mean, yeah. And as far as I go, I mean, I was never going to buy it in the first place but I, what i would probably be buying if i even get uh the zen 3 i mean uh yeah zen 3 is Z- zen 2 <laughs> yeah is uh if i got ryzen 3 would be um ryzen 3000 yeah i i which if i upgrade this year i'm probably going to be getting something like a 2700 but yeah that's something i keep stressing is prices are coming down already you're never going to beat the price performance of the r5 1600 at 90 dollars at micro center (laughs) i mean this is pentium prices for a 12 thread processor that will always run games at 60 frames a second for the next five years like that that's what you got (laughs) to get and you can upgrade that whenever you want when the newer stuff gets cheaper and the 2700 and 2700X, they're going to be below $200 within three months. And I would not be surprised if around back to school in this fall, you started to see 2700s. Maybe not, you know, 2700Xs, but 2700s for like 180 And at that price, I mean, I kind of recommend it over the 3600 Like, it, it's the same. It has two more cores. It has 10% less IPC, but it's clocked probably about the same. I yeah. yeah, which which is why I'm waiting uh, for a little bit to see how all of the prices shake out to see what ends up being the best price performance in the my desired performance area. But yeah, I mean, you can get some great chips right now for under a hundred dollars, and in the next few months, probably even better. So let's actually move on to number four here in the news is the X590 motherboards teased. I'm actually, so I did a video talking about it because, and and in hindsight, I kind of think a lot of the rumor websites misreported and I just made a video quick, (laughs) frankly, but it sounds like actually from what I'm reading in other places that that might be Threadrippers coming out in October or I I guess either way, it doesn't matter. I I think I, I I think my X590 video is actually a good video just talking about X570 in general. Anyone who complains about how expensive that is. The X570 chipset's going to offer arguably better features than Intel's HEDT motherboards. So that's why it costs slightly less than <laughs> Intel's HEDT motherboards. And I, everyone's freaking out because there's $800 options. And it's like, there's also $180 options. And I looked and they have these big heat sinks, fans, lights on them. 
So I'm not... Guys, the $800 option isn't going to, well, do anything, I think. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. I don't think it's going to do anything. A lot of them seem to just have hookups so you can cool the VRMs with liquid cooling, which, sure, if that's what you need. But Yeah, that's cool, but no one, if you're just gaming or something like that, you don't, you don't need that. <laughs> I mean, my honest-to-God recommendation is if you want a budget build... Well, or at least a reasonably priced performance build. Get an actually probably a four a B four fifty motherboard, or if you can get it for like a hundred twenty bucks an X four seventy. You don't need PCIe three point for the six cores that are coming out. Just get that. And if you want to go above that, ah, I think X five seventy is good, but don't pay more than two fifty for the motherboard. And there's plenty <laughs> at two hundred. There's literally nothing wrong with these motherboards. I what what you're seeing right now is Intel's given up on the HEDT lineup with Threadripper one and then with right with threadripper 2 and ryzen 2000 they started giving up on desktop and now they're going to completely abandon desktop so what are these manufacturers who are making piles of money on reselling <laughs> intel motherboard chips that's going to do well they need to find a way to make ultra premium x570 motherboards that's why there's expensive options which actually leads me into a reader mail question which of course you can if you are a uh patreon member right mail to be heard on air and will tr909 asks didn't intel already stop caring about desktop a long time ago it's just now they can't compete on mainstream and it's damaging the brand and mindshare that bothers them the most and uh that's why they're probably pulling out of it is intel pulling out of desktop because it's better to not look bad i think that's an interesting <laughs> point like maybe that's why they're not bothering because it'd be better to just kind of go cheaper um, I mean, yeah, I can kind of see where this is coming from. Like their big money maker, what they've mainly focused on, at least from the consumer marketplace for the past, I don't know, however many years has been, uh, laptops and desktops have kind of generally just been an afterthought. I don't know if they're going to pull out of the desktop market because like, uh, you said the, the desktop market, uh, shit creates a lot of the mind share that we see in the community. But, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I could see it over the next couple years, them mainly just focusing on optimizing and creating good uh, laptop chips and going for industry and going for industries like servers and kind of leaving desktops by the wayside. So that brings me to so that was number two. That brings me to number three. Thirty nine fifty X beating the ninety nine hundred K in single threaded. And beating a eighteen two thousand dollar eighteen core HEDT chip, also in multi threaded. <laughs> I mean, any thoughts on that? I mean, like just looking at this, it's kind of crazy that how much AMD is dominating the market, at least for power at this point. And I mean, when you look at when you look at uh, prices like this, it's hard to complain. Yeah, and it's hard to... The $2,000 18-core is yeah, losing it's... to a $750 chip. They yeah, so, half the energy. Uh, so I know people were angry about the $750 price point, but for the performance you're getting for it, it, it it's insane. Like, AMD isn't a charity, and yeah, maybe to an extent they're milking right now, but if they're milking, Intel has some problems with their manufacturer. <laughs> Yeah, and you actually found this. It wasn't a story on our script here, but that DigiTimes reported Intel's going to drop prices by 15% this year, it looks like. And didn't you also say that you saw Tom's Hardware said that's fantastical? Is that literally the word they use, by the way? Fantastical. Yeah, fantastical. And that the, that response would be, uh, well, I, I you can't remember the exact phrase, but paraphrasing, um, essentially that this almost isn't necessary i mean if oh they, no if they actually want to compete intel should just lose everything <laughs> this isn't yeah i, I want to touch on that because calling a 15 percent price drop fantastical is hilarious because i say it's not fucking enough 15 percent so yeah. let, let's let's i really want to break this down here the 3700x is maybe a little weaker than the 9900k but remember in the benchmarks amd shows at e3 it's said in the patch notes no security mitigation patches used for intel that was amd showing intel at the their best and they're excited because when the reviews come out they know half of the reviewers 
will have security patches on and <laughs> Intel's going to be performing 10% worse than what they showed. So really the 3800X is $400 eight core that is going to basically tie the 9900K in performance, if not beat it outright, if not right away, eventually I imagine as more games come out, it'll beat it. So if you drop a $480 and it's usually over 500, but I've seen it for 480 recently. So I'm being nice. A $480 9900K drop it by 15%. So what we're now down to like $420. It's still $20 more than the 3800X <laughs> that uses less energy and has a better, like this is, and it comes with a cooler that works. You don't, you can actually use the box coolers AMD gives you. 420 is not enough. It yeah. needs to be cheaper. I I mean, yeah, you're speaking to the choir right now. It's just uh, it's just at this point AMD is so clearly the better option if you're buying this year. Um I I don't have much more to add to that. It's just if Intel wants to remain competitive in the desktop space, which frankly, I don't know if they actually do care that much at this point, but Yeah, I don't really think they do. But yeah, if they want to remain competitive, they need to cut prices and maybe actually include decent fans again. Um, I think once you get above five hundred dollars, you don't need to include a fan. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's true. Everybody's but using aftermarkets at that point. It would behoove them to have some kind of semi-low profile, decently <clears throat> cooling fan. The problem Intel has with that though is their chips. They lie about the TDP. So AMD has a sixty-five watt. Uh, 3600, I think they said, I could be wrong, the 3700X is 95 or 65 watts, mm -hmm. but at least the non-X versions when those come out will be 65 watts. Yeah, they can include a $20 fan, and it will auto-overclock to you, whatever, right? 4.4 gigahertz on its own. Intel can't do that. Intel would have to include a liquid cooler, because in truth, the 9900K at 95 watts is like, okay, now it's running at 3.6 gigahertz. <laughs> like, it's, they can't do that. They would lose every benchmark if they, because people would do that. They would benchmark Intel's processors with the fan it comes with, and it would lose at everything. So this is just a, and, and so that brings me to, what price do you think it should be at? Where like So like the 9700K, the 8-core, no hyper-threading, is at like $400 now? I've seen it cheaper, but let's say it's 400 I think, so 15% isn't enough. Yeah, the, I, I don't know, probably, what, three, 300 around that price point? I That's what I think. If Intel was serious about being a better option for the price, at least moving forward, I think the 9900K needs, I think i9s need to be, uh, I mean, below 400 easily. And I think 350 for the 9900K, 300 for the 9700K. The i5s need to be below 200, and the i3s need to be below 100. And the Pentiums should be 50 bucks, which they can probably afford to do, if we're being honest. <laughs> they probably don't cost anything yeah. to make. And so anyone call again, calling this fantastical, it's not enough. That's what this is. All right, so number four, Intel is manufacturing mobile rocket lake on Samsung's 14 nanometer. Uh... That actually took me by surprise. Did did that surprise you when you saw that in my script? Yeah, I mean, I, I Intel's known for always doing all of their production in house, and yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a worrisome sign that Intel can't keep up with production uh, of their currently uh, refined processes while they're trying to get onto new nodes. And for those who don't know, they've done this before, but only for twenty-two nanometer chipsets. They did that before. They've never really been okay. And I and they, I know they've used some outdated nodes from competitors for Atom chips and limited amounts, but they've never done this with like a real modern architecture version of a chip. And so this is actually a big deal. I saw this and I think not a lot of people talked about it. And I'm like, <laughs> guys, this is huge. This is a first for Intel. This tells you how bad their capacity problems are. And I've saw a lot of people actually then to that say, why would they have capacity problems? AMD is about to kill them, which AMD is not about to kill Intel, <laughs> guys. It takes a lot more than, you know, one, than a few big wins to kill Intel. What's going on is um, the, the market's growing so quickly that Intel could literally keep their current customers and AMD could get to like, go from like, you know, if we're talking server, like five to 20% market share 
And that could just be AMD taking the growth in the market. Yeah, I mean, which would still hurt Intel in the long run because, yeah, they're not going to be making as much profits, but there's, it's not like they're going to not be making money anymore. And, and, and the only way they would hold on to their existing customers is because they're giving chips away for like half the price they normally would at that point. So, <laughs> yeah. yes, they're keeping their market share, but they're making less revenue. I mean, that's what is probably the most likely scenario, unless Zen 3 does indeed turn out to be as big of an upgrade as Zen 2 at the end of next year. And then it's just pretty much game over in a lot of sectors. But Yeah, unless Intel was able to plan for this from a couple of years ago. So they have something to some killer chip one or two years down the road right which who knows I, if they and i think that might be what they're thinking of now too they're getting into bed with samsung early learning how to work with them early so that um they can if they have to make some halo products on samsung 7 nanometer euv in 2021 which will be ready by then and that's but but what's important to remember is let's say they do do that they bring out like a 16 core i9 in 2021 on samsung 7 nanometer euv it probably won't clock as fast as Intel's 14 nanometer, first of all. Second of all, that doesn't really solve any problems besides some perception that fanboys have. Because the real issue for Intel, when you're a company this big, you need to make not one i9, but 10 million a year. And that won't work on a new node on Samsung. They need to be able to pump this out. That's why they're using 14 nanometer. People have said, wait, why aren't they going to use 7 nanometer? in 2021 at samsung because they don't <laughs> they just want more capacity and they want to have one design they're making at 20 fabs at once until they can make all of their fabs make a high performance 10 nanometer or hopefully a 7 nanometer in three years they are up shit creek really they're up shit creek they need to be able to make the best chips at every fab or they're at a massive disadvantage for how they run their business all right so moving on then, let's see here. Uh, number five, Threadripper 3 supposedly coming in October. We already touched on that a little bit, but yeah, I mean, 64 core is possibly this year, Dan, on a Threadripper chip. I mean, that sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, just seeing a number like that on a consumer chip is really cool, even if I personally won't be getting it. But <laughs> Now, here's the thing. I want my next build to kind of be a dream build. If, and I'm willing to wait, I'm willing to wait six months for prices to come down or everything to be out and settled. Although I like to upgrade much sooner. So all of my data is actually protected. But um, if that 24 core, and usually Threadrippers are about 200 megahertz faster than their desktop counterparts because they've got the best yields. If that 24 core is like 4.8, 4.9 gigahertz for $1,000, I can't pass that up. <laughs> That's going to be insane. And... I mean, I, I don't have much to add to this story, except it does seem like Zen 3 is being pushed back a little bit, and they're, therefore they are possibly bringing out a full Threadripper lineup. So I guess, I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just kind of... Yeah, I mean, I don't, know, I, I don't know what that signals. I don't know if that means they think that they can get away with not releasing it for longer and just going on to... and. Uh, releasing Threadripper instead or what the way Lisa Sue would put it is we now know we're in a comfortable enough position to take our time and make Zen 3 the best product it can be that's what she would say which it's not lying but I do think they would be rushing <laughs> if they Intel had uh, or next year yeah if Intel had I don't know anything worth buying anymore <laughs> anyways uh Maho Min writes in and says, Tom, do you think Ryzen 3000 launch will have a tangible effect on how fast DDR4 surplus dries up? Do you think DRAM manufacturers are going to focus on DDR5? I don't think DDR5... Well, actually, I do. I think they're going to start ramping up DDR5 at the end of this year. We know Zen 3 will support DDR5. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to be honest. For budget builds now, I really think now is the time to build your budget build. Like, this month. And I think if you want a dream build, you maybe wait till late fall. Uh, but I could see prices going up again because I remember prices went up for everything, not just because of mining, but because everyone was waiting for 16 and 14 nanometer stuff to come out in 2016. And so they all bought Polaris and mostly Pascal chips. And then they all bought new motherboards too and all this other stuff. And basically everything was expensive because of that. And I don't think it's going to be as bad as before, but... 
I mean, how many people in forums are saying they waited for now to upgrade? It's like yeah, universal. That's, yeah, that's true. It's if you want to build a budget build now is probably or around when Zen uh, comes out is probably going to be a good time to get upgrade just because prices are going to be reduced for uh, older chips and newer chips are going to be completely gone for the next few months, which I wouldn't be surprised if that's what we see happens after their release. Which which I still think will be a good time for budget builds. I could see those drying up and then rising 1,000 chips still in stock at like 120 bucks, Guys, again, <laughs> R7... R, yeah, wait, what is it? Yeah, R7-1700. It's like a 3.8 gigahertz 8 core. If that's $120, and I think it will be this fall. That's... Dude, if you actually care about price performance, everyone says they do. I don't believe them anymore because I can see what's happening. But if you actually do, you, yes, get Ryzen 1000. It works great. It's just not clocked as fast. The IPC isn't really that much worse, too, now that they've worked out the kinks in the motherboard chip sets. You just get, you know, 2600 megahertz RAM or faster. Ideally, 3000 megahertz and then tighten the timings. And it's pretty damn good all right number six seven nanometer apus are coming and quarter one or quarter four or quarter one 2020 for am4 it's like quarter one or quarter four quarter four 2019 oh, quarter oh, one sorry, 2020 sorry. um i mean this seems pretty cool i mean i like i always like seeing what amd is planning out with their uh apus I don't have too much to say on the subject. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I guess what I would add is there's a place for the 12 nanometer monolithic APUs they're still selling. The quad cores with eight threads and a RX 560 equivalent GPU. Like, that's always going to be there, guys. And in fact, I haven't done a video on it yet, but I will. AMD plans to split off development into two trees, two branches soon, where they continue to make monolithic dies that are about 100 millimeters squared on 7 nanometer. We're talking maybe six or eight cores at most, probably six cores, 12 threads, and a built-in, like, Navi, I don't know, 20 compute unit chip. Like, and that makes sense, because it costs money to make the I.O. die. It costs money to attach it to two chiplets. I've heard there's a floor in price for Zen 2 and therefore Zen 3 and moving forward. You, it really, one of the main benefits is it allows you to get combined the best yields to have a 16 core at 5 gigahertz eventually. It's not that it really makes the cheaper chips cheaper. In fact, you really can't make it cheaper <laughs> than $120 is what I heard. So if you want something for cheap ultrabooks or netbooks or like, you know, those $80 APUs, they're going to have to start working on something that's better than what Cabini was and Bobcat processors were. But that's what's coming. And right now, I think you're going to see these 12 nanometer APUs fill that slot until they make the complete the branch. And the complete branch off where they're just making There's these two tiny slightly different dies. architectures. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of just what I wanted to talk about there. Uh, number seven. TSMC working on two nanometer development for 2025. Um, I mean, I'm excited about this and I'm a little saddened by it almost because it's it's really cool that we're finally to two nanometers. Or that's going probably to be the soon. last one. But yeah, that's why I'm saddened. This might be the last die shrink we really can see using uh, silicone chips unless some physicist that knows a lot more about physics than URI <laughs> figures out, out a way around it. Well, they already pretty much know they can get to graphene. It's just going to take the research. Well, I mean, I mean the money. Like you just have to do it. And I've been thinking more and more about this. I mean, Intel's stuck on 14 nanometer and then 10 nanometer for lower power laptop chips for the next three years. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some server chips on 10 nanometer in 2022. Okay, so when is there... 7 nanometer coming out then, 2023, 2024? I mean, are they going to bring out... That's just what I'm thinking. Is Intel going to bring out 7 nanometer in 2023? And that's best case scenario, guys. 2023, and then AMD will be on 5 nanometer when they bring 7 nanometer out? And then a year after their 7 nanometer out, is AMD going to bring out a 2 <laughs> nanometer? Or at least a 3, probably? 
Because I know I'm, three nanometers on schedule for 2023, I believe. I mean, yeah, I, I don't see how Intel really gains a lead past AMDs. Or, well, I should say TSMC at this point with their uh, node uh, process, size processes. But. So, so they need to get to seven nanometer. I was thinking, you know what? This is where one place I could see them catch up again. It would behoove Intel to actually press forward and get to graphene or, you know, nano. There's another one I've heard of recently, uh, like molybdenum sulfide. Yes, but... I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, some kind of nano enhanced silicon structures that they need to get to that in 2026. They need to be the first one to start selling chips you put in your motherboard that aren't silicon or at least aren't traditional silicon. Which, That's all they can do. To yeah, which up. who knows? Maybe I—I I, I don't know. Maybe they are starting to put research Pre- money into it. Pressure makes diamonds. Well, they are. They are researching it. But so is TSMC. And I think this is one of those times where Intel can't just like advertise they're doing something. They need to do it <laughs> because they need to follow up seven nanometer versus three nanometer by saying in two years one nanometer graphene or molybdenum sulfide or something like that that's their next move and it needs to be combined with some new architecture that brings an innovation as big as infinity fabric that's really the only way i see them catching up and catching up in a half a decade from now no a decade from now basically which worries me about with that is just we're still so far behind with all of those potential technologies that I don't know how much R and D money you would need to pour into. Take it some of that McAfee money <laughs> and put it. That's what I and this is what and Intel, buy another antivirus and buy, company and buy Kapirsky. Yes, <laughs> well, I think Kapirsky works. I'm like McAfee. <laughs> Anyways, Bootman writes in AMD did their thing in E3. No more cheap chips. In my opinion, AMD priced 5700 to clear Polaris and Vegas stock. At Computex, Intel was heavy on laptops as they have no options anymore, and even that was weak at best. NVIDIA did nothing as they don't have to. Software is the next thing, I guess? Getting software to work better than hard- with hardware? Three years ago, we had four cores at top, now it's 16 to 32, and now we need to keep up. I guess let's just, uh, let's ignore, I'm gonna, I think I've already addressed the second half of that before in uh, other videos and in a discussion. I, will, I do want to talk about this, though, that Bootman said. I mean, I think I agree. I think some of it is to clear Polaris and Vegas stock. Uh, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Like, just given the uh, performance brackets some of these are added, it would behoove them to clear their Polaris stock eventually and doing it before all of their other cards are released. Yeah. Well, and I think they're waiting. They want to see NVIDIA's full cards, which leads us to number eight. Uh, NVIDIA Super may effectively be an RTX 3000 series. It almost which, follows directly one of the lineups I hypothesized a few months ago. Which makes me wonder why they aren't calling this the RTX 3000 series. I know. I was in a discussion. I was just talking to Chris privately a week ago. We were talking about the Super lineup together. And I just kept saying to him, call it RTX 3000. You need to reboot your brand. People hate you right now. Well, I think what they're trying to do is make their pricing brackets as confusing as possible right now. So they just have yeah. cards everywhere and uh, increments of 5%. Which is, if you look, so how it looks like it might shake out is effectively they're going <clears> to <throat> drop in the new cards at the old founder's price. Which are going to be, you know, a solid 15% stronger, it looks like. Like the 2060 Super looks... It's a 2070. And the 2070 Super is basically a 2080. And the 2080 Super is getting uh, 15% more bandwidth and more enabled cores clocked faster. I mean, it looks like a 15% performance increase across the board at the original prices. And then they're dropping all cards down like $100 in price. I mean... Yeah, I, I mean, I think good they're making stronger cards but i just don't understand why they're being so confusing with what they're naming things yeah and i don't and what a dumb name super i just like call it the black <laughs> edition or i like the idea of unlocked edition because they're unlocking more cuticores which uh, if you're on yeah no, <laughs> i think it sounds way cooler <laughs> but um <laughs> if you look then 2070 stays 500 dollars. 5700 xt don't look so overpriced anymore does it <laughs> like unfortunately that's the world we live in right now 
And I think what AMD wanted to do is they're like, well, we could price this at 400 and be aggressive, but a- NVIDIA's already showed their hand. They're doing a refresh of like 10 to 15% more performance and slight price drops. What if we just make a better card for more for you know less money and just keep it that little bit cheaper that little bit stronger and then really see if nvidia is willing to go to war over this and if they're not whatever yeah (laughs) and i think amd will lower prices eventually if they need to but it's going to be up to the market does everyone buy up the 5700 xt in mass and they probably don't need to drop prices, but they certainly are leaving plenty of room. And if you look at my analysis, you can see that I said even with the 45% Lisa Sue markup, uh, <laughs> the 3700 XT or 5700 XT would be like $340 at most. So even if they could drop so they still have a lot of room to decrease they could price. drop prices they don't quite have nvidia margins right now but it's not far away anymore and so they want to meet them at the same margins or almost the same margins and prepare for a price war i guess we'll see what happens but don't be surprised if there are some big moves by amd in the holiday period where they go like a 50 dollars price cut borderlands 3 bundle like i really think that's what's coming all right <laughs> Number nine. So Google Stadia was revealed and you have to buy a console and you have to pay for uh, a monthly fee. What do you think? Um, I mean, I was hoping that they would do something like I, I, I mean, I guess when I saw it coming out, I was always a bit confused about what they were going to go for. This seems to be a kind of strange way to target this like i didn't think they were going to be selling a box with it i thought maybe it was going to be a subscription service with ads or something or or it's like it's not a box but you get the controller and it's like 130 dollars. i don't know yeah so i guess so it's not a box i should rephrase that there's no box but you have to buy a controller or they heavily want you to (laughs) well the reason i say buy a box is 130 dollars. all right it's about as much as a box um I think they're going for the premium crowd first. 4K 60 hertz HDR. Yep, that's how dumb PC gaming is now. Streaming might have higher quality video. I mean, the one thing that would worry me with Stadia about uh, that is I don't know how many people have that internet speed that would be capable of supporting We're going to have to see. Because what was it they said required for that? Was it 35 megabit per second? or Yeah, for 4K. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I believe that the, that's the all they need. The concern I but... would have with that is, wait, is it going to be using that much data the whole time I'm playing? <laughs> that's a lot if you have a data cap. Yeah, and and the problem of latency still comes to mind. Um, I mean, Which listen... I've heard the latency shouldn't be bad in cities. Some people have tried okay. it. So far... So far, so so good. (laughs) So far, so good. This is the least shitty streaming service ever made. But that's what I will continue to think of it as. It's about not being shitty, not about being good. However, if they really deliver artifact-free or almost artifact-free 4K 60 hertz HDR and it's smooth 60 hertz, I mean, what do you guys want? It's cheaper. I mean, yeah, that's great. I'm just a little skeptical on it. Oh, yeah, you should be skeptical, too. The one thing I'll say is they announced the base plan is coming out next year and there will be a free plan. Yeah. Um, so I really think they're going premium crowd first because PC gaming isn't even standard at 4K 60 hertz yet. Yeah, and if they're going for that free model where you're clicking on ads, I'm curious how popular that's going to be among people, I'm sure. I just like the idea of trying I'm... out a game for free. <laughs> that's just what I want. I want I... to see an ad for the new Assassin's Creed, click play now, plug in my controller and try it out for 10 minutes and see if I want it. Which, yeah, and if Google Stadia can deliver on that even if it the free version year. is just... they have to get everything working so that's probably why they're not doing the free thing first they only want the premium people with the good internet to be trying it early yeah and if the free version really is you can just click on a game play it for 10 minutes after clicking on an ad even if it's in shitty quality that's is really cool and i'm i'm curious to see how stadia uh how stadia changes the marketplace yeah number 10 playstation classic the well-received, well-regarded, everyone said, this needs to exist. PlayStation Classic's uh, $30 now. It launched at $100 seven months ago. 
I'm sorry. This is what I find funny in this article. Is this on Tech Spot? It says uh, probably being sold below cost. I disagree. I don't think it is. I think that controller. What, what the hell is being put into it that would make this be? A it's, mo- an, it's a it's a nothing burger arm SOC. Just give me. It's probably <laughs> maybe at cost. I, I I think it might cost twenty dollars to make the thing. If it costs more, I don't know what they're putting into it because well, not a whole lot. It turns out from reviews. <laughs> what, what it seems like they uh, plugged a ras a uh, flash drive into a Raspberry Pi and put a small PS One chassis around it. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> uh, the reason I brought this up it has nothing to do with PC gaming, but this is going to lead into our next ones. I just want to like call out how dumb this was by Sony. Like this <laughs> console, it's Sony is like AMD. I compare them. It's like when they do things right, it's excellent. But when they do things wrong, it's like, why did you bother? You made all this other great stuff. And who did this? Who came, Who executed this? And it goes to show you that you can't just shit out a console. So many companies, remember the Oya? Yes. <laughs> like all these Android, you can't just make a console, make it $100 and say it's cheaper than other consoles and people buy it. It takes... Uh, the biggest determination of if a console does well, from what I can tell, is it sounds cheesy, but the amount of heart and soul put into it. Yeah, I, I mean, or... Yeah, I mean, the more sincere they seem. Like, yeah, I feel like you could see this with the... Uh, it, it's hard to make a console ecosystem. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like you could see this with the PS4 uh, and Xbox One unveiling. The PS4 unveiling was exciting. They were excited about the product. The only yeah. criticism they got is, what's the box? um (laughs) yeah that's right i remember that and uh the xbox one it just seemed like a soulless they were sarcastic mean to the entire time they said you're fucking stupid if you don't buy an xbox unless you're on a submarine you can still get an xbox 360 then (laughs) yeah yeah they said a lot of intelligent things um and and then go back to the wii u it's like no soul. I remember the reveal was like, uh, and it was like he didn't. I, I, I guess this is the Wii U. <laughs> yeah, and then when they unveiled the Switch, they super were like exciting because it's a exciting. real, it's a cool, innovative console. Mm-hmm. Even if I don't own one, they were one. smiling. The original Wii, they were ecstatic about what they had come up with. Like you just don't see that if if there's not, and 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 I think the PlayStation Classic specifically was Sony saw. Look at all the money they made with the NES and SNES classics. We could shit this out and it'll sell well. Yeah. No, you can't. That's that seems it seems like the embodiment of an out of touch executive move. Yeah, just like hey, uh, we're gonna do this too because they're making money. If we even get ten percent of this pie, we'll have a lot of cheddar. <laughs> All right, number eleven. <laughs> so moving on, there's been just in general a lot of next gen console news coming out. I've gotten out my precursor PlayStation Five and Xbox. Well, I think the Xbox One is looking to slowly merge their console into PC gaming, maybe make it modular, or... And by Xbox One, you mean oh, Project Scarlet? Yeah, I shouldn't say Xbox One. Uh, I mean... The Xbox brand in general, you think yeah, they're the, slowly the Xbox, merging? Yeah, whatever they call it. Xbox Two is what I keep calling it. Which some people think that's a dumb name, and I'm like, mm, well, it's not as dumb as Xbox One. <laughs> At least I <laughs> was the able dumbest to console just... name. Well, Wii U was the dumbest console name. But at least I would be able to distinguish it from other consoles that they had released. So that that's a plus. You know, I've heard some people say they should just call it Xbox. Yeah. Maybe. I don't think... You don't like that. Dan made a cringy face. I don't think they're there yet. Um, I think they need to fully merge their platform into a point where people forget that the Xbox brand was a console. If it point. is modular, they could get away with doing that, though. Like, it's the Xbox Core, and you can upgrade it with whatever graphics card you want. Xbox Core or something like that. Ooh, might that be. might be a good one. Yeah. a lot. I also saw rumors that they might use Crossfire. There's a hint that they might use a dual Navi chip that's like six teraflops. And then they'll have a Anaconda, which is the, the streaming, eventually streaming only version, the cheap 1440p version. Basically, the Xbox One X replacement will use one of the chips, and then the <laughs> stronger version will crossfire two of them. And the reason I like that idea, though, is it would make sense if instead of making two different dies, they just made the same die and crossfired. Yeah, I mean, and I feel like if they had something like that, that might point to 
I don't know, maybe modularity in the future, or if those rumors... No, they could just do three. Yeah. They could keep die shrinking it and do four, or, you know... Well, if that strategy is... It actually works from, like, a computer hardware perspective. But I think it would, frankly. Like, I don't see why they couldn't... And I guess everything I see about Xbox is about merging it into PC, modularity, whether it means you can upgrade it, or they have, like, Lego blocks of graphics cards they're taping together for stronger units in the future. That's what I'm basically seeing about Xbox, whereas PlayStation seems to be an overall unified vision, instant loading, tons of RAM... Oh, yeah, what do you think about that, Dan? The fact that both consoles, both, yeah. especially with emphasis, at least Sony's been talking about it more, talked about it first, this idea that what they're going to do is have like a two terabyte ultra, ultra fast, like PCIe 4.0 NVMe drive or faster, and that they will reserve about 100 gigabytes of the two terabytes as a like a third tier RAM buffer. I mean, uh, that sounds incredibly exciting to me. And... uh. You could load based the whole that, game into the RAM. Based on that project, uh, Project Scarlet. Um, they talk about the exact same thing. They talk about the exact same thing. So I think that is where the console space is at least moving to next gen, which, I mean, I find that incredibly exciting. Imagine booting up GTA, and instead of banging your head against the desk waiting for five minutes for it to load, it just is like instant like and it keeps one second it loads and with gta it will keep loading you into the wrong thing but it yeah will do really lo- but, but then when you load it again <laughs> you're set off oh, anyone who played gta online it was like playing the loading game for 20 minutes before you played anything uh, a lot of people still play that too um so what are your overall thoughts about next gen though like so we just talked about the hardware but like with relation to pc gaming I mean, I'm excited for what Next Gen potentially has to offer based on what both Project Scarlet has said, which they've been a little more vague. And the concrete things that Sony has said about the PlayStation 5 are, yeah, I think they're probably going to call it the PlayStation 5, but they should. Um, I'm excited. I'm a little worried about what the pricing is going to be. I, I think it's probably going to be around $500, but a little part yeah. of me is worried that the one or both of them so it sounds like there's two versions of the Xbox, one that's diskless, one that's weaker, really an Xbox One X replacement that they can program games on for. Maybe even be like if you make it for the weaker version, it also has to work on Xbox One X. Well, they can't do that because Xbox One X has a crazy weak CPU compared to next gen. So that will only work for so long. Um, but I guess I'm thinking the weak one for the Xbox, if it's diskless, it, it could come in at 350 Oh, if there were multiple... 380 maybe would probably be where you want to put it. If, if there were multiple SKUs for the uh, for the Xbox One X or... Xbox I mean, Xbox two. two. Xbox Two or PS5. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we had at least one of those SKUs coming in at below 400. And I'm worried if the premium one... I, I'm worried that that could be above 500 for either of them. And though. I keep waiting for more information to come out. I will be doing... I've already done like three or four precursor videos to next gen, but I want more concrete info before I really do this because I want to dig in. I want to put the specs next to each other like I did with Navi versus Turing. And I really want to say this is where this is coming out. This is where that's coming out. Sony's overall vision is this. Microsoft's overall vision is that. And then even throw Stadia and Nintendo's next gen into the mix and saying this is what I think they should do. We're not quite there yet, but we're dangerously close to where I'm going to make the next-gen console series. And when I look at this, though, I have done some pre-research. Guys, it really isn't as expensive to make these consoles as you think. The way I looked at it is if they had two versions of a PlayStation, the way I would at least do it is you want at least something about as strong as Radeon 7 or, you know, like basically a highly cut-down Navi 20 with 320-bit or 384-bit memory bus to have 20, 24 gigabytes of RAM. Something like that. That much GDR6. Guys, it's like $5 a gigabyte, especially by the end of next year, even for the fast stuff. $5 a gigabyte for RAM. So 5 times 20, okay, 100 bucks for the RAM. And then you add in the motherboard, you know, this there, power supply. It all comes out to 
between like 480 and 600 dollars to make what i think would be a 2080 in between a 2080 and 2080 ti console with a super fast drive and they sell their consoles at a loss they do sell them at a loss but i don't if it ends up on the Even high end of that just estimates, a 10 percent loss yeah if we're it ends talking up at, about 500 dollars, but i could see it 549 which yeah i don't see them sony ever doing 600 again and probably to turn every one of these console manufacturers from doing a $600 price point just because it failed so hard, at least in the short term. But um, even if they're selling at a loss, if it ends up at the $600 mark, I don't see them selling them at these astronomical losses like they used to in prior no. console they'd be generations. insane to do that. Like, what was the... What were they selling the PS3? I believe the 360 was uh, cost about six hundred bucks. Six, I've heard it higher than that. But let's say it was six hundred dollars to make, and they were selling it for four hundred dollars. There were some estimates that said seven to eight hundred though for like the first month. And the PS3 was a similar about story. eight hundred bucks sold yeah. for six five to six hundred. But yeah, given how I, I think Sony's probably been able to be profitable for almost this entire generation of them selling consoles, or I, I mean for the hardware itself. Yeah, I think they've been profiting since 2014. Yeah, so given that, I don't think they're I, I don't think they're going to do that again like what they yeah, did with the PS3 and 360. Here. Yeah, you guys, the PS4 Pro costs like $200 to make. <laughs> we just put that into perspective when you talk about how expensive the next gen will be. So something no, it's not and, and like the case isn't going to cost more, the power supply is not going to cost more for next gen. The only thing changing is really I mean even the RAM's crazy cheap. Yeah. Even in comparison, it's probably the RAM cost twice as much for GDR6. I think literally that's it. <laughs> you can only make RAM so cheap. Like, I, I really think what we're going to look at is something like 529. As, I don't know. I think 529 for a 4K 60 hertz HDR. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably going to be the ballpark and where they're at. It's, that's where I think yes. they'll target it. Yeah, which... We'll see. I, I'm not fully convinced they will have two versions yet. I'm not either. Maybe. I'm not sure yet. But I, I don't know. I'm excited. They're definitely thinking about it. I'm excited for six months down the road when we actually might see some real concrete information on what these things are. Yeah. And I wonder what it's going to do to PC gaming. Because I, I, that's the thing I keep telling people. If you need to buy now, you're not going to beat the prices of Vega. I get RX 5700 for 380. It's better than Vega 64. So for 380... It's better than 2060. I, I'm okay with the 5700 at $380. But just keep in mind, you're paying the price of almost what an entire console is going to cost a year and a half from now that will be stronger. And I'm sorry, that's just what PC gaming is now. And it just sucks. <laughs> but this is where we are. People just keep racing to the top. They've stacked, you know, I talked about this with Chris. They put their flags in their camp and they're okay being built by their own company. Uh, everything is meaningless. And life is pointless. And when all I see is 3D Mark benchmarks and talking about the next node, I'm like, you guys are actually playing games on this thing, right? Well, all I want my PC for is to have the highest number so I can feel better. So I can own people on forums. Yeah, but... so you can own people in the WCCF tech comments. I exactly. <laughs> Let's we'll see how we edit this together. Just a bunch <laughs> of depressing statements at the end. I think we should probably wrap it up. Any last thoughts, Dan? Uh... I hope all of you have a good day. This is about as half-hearted as the PlayStation Classic. <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Broken Silicon, a PC hardware and gaming podcast, is brought to you by me, Tom, of Moore's Laws Dead, and also co-hosted by my brother, Dan. Please visit Moore's Laws Dead at YouTube to see much more in-depth analysis of AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA products and rumors. Also, if you love this podcast, please subscribe and consider giving me a review on your distributor of choice. It really does help. And if you really like this and my other content, please consider supporting me on Patreon at Moore's Laws Dead. Unlocked or higher supporters get to submit questions and have in-depth discussions with me after videos and podcasts. Plus, there are a lot of intelligent people on the included Discord channel that are having some pretty enlightening hardware discussions right now. I bet they wish you could join them. In fact, I will now give thanks to my Netburst or higher supporters immediately because I could not afford to dedicate the time or resources necessary to providing this content you like without these supporters. And so, without further ado, well, actually let me say this. 
This is not a stitched together edit of every name that I have recorded recently. Every week, I say the same thank yous to all the names on my list again because I want to remember all the people making this possible. On June 21st, 2019, Bootman, Hunter Drake, Ben Grossen, Dean, Ruckus, Justin Yant, Thomas Rupp, Tomas Paraj, Jesse Blanton, Will L, Jordan Betcher, Mohammed Al Kawari, Victor Janecki, Matthew Brubacher, Prime Tech, Justin Parrish, and Zachary Martin. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>